Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. And I want to speak tonight on the crosses before the cross. The crosses before the cross. The Gospel of John, chapter 18. And I want to speak tonight on two things. I want to speak on the treachery. This is our outline for tonight. Two points, the treachery of Judas and the tragedy of Peter. The treachery, that would be our subtitle. The treachery of Judas Iscariot and the tragedy of Simon Peter. Let's read first of all about Judas. I'm in John chapter 18 and I'm beginning to read in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, sometimes pronounced Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered. That would be the garden of Gethsemane and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayeth him, stood with them. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. You know, I've often wondered if that's where we get the expression, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. All right, turn over if you would. Turn over if you would to verse number 19. Verse number 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why ask thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? You know, when somebody cuts your ear off, you have a tendency to remember them. Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, he would not have delivered him, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. And then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put away any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. Do you all understand the significance of that? That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. If the Jews would have taken it upon themselves to execute Christ, how would they have done it? Pardon? They would have stoned him. But the Romans crucified. And it was predicted that he would be crucified. Even before crucifixion was ever invented, it says in Psalms 22, it was written 700 years before crucifixion was ever invented. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 33, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, art thou king of the Jews? 
Jesus answered him, saying, uh, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, what I should not, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is the truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find no fault, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I want to speak tonight on the crosses before the cross. These verses begin a series of events which will culminate with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What we're getting ready to see over the next few weeks in rapid fire succession are the arrest of Jesus, the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, and the resurrection of Christ. I see two things as we study the Gospel of John from this point forward. Number one, I see man at his very worst. And number two, I see God at his very best. This is the blackest page in human history. As a matter of fact, these events are so black and so dark and they so reveal the depravity of man that if you only looked at these passages from a human perspective, it would be very depressing. But you and I have the privilege of not just looking at these things from a human perspective, but also from a divine perspective. That's why I said that you see man at his very worst but you also see God at his very best. First of all, and this is all just by way of introduction, we see man at his worst. We see man rejecting and crucifying his own creator. We see man rejecting and crucifying the one that loves him the most. We see man torturing and killing and taking the life from the very one that gave man life. We see man at his worst. But we also see God at his very best. We see God paying for sins that he did not commit. We see God suffering a hell that he does not deserve. And we see God laying down his life, not for people that are lovely, not for people that are lovable, but for people that are sinful and depraved. Tonight, I want to point out a couple of crosses, so to speak, that Jesus endured even before he went to the literal cross. I want to talk about the treachery of Judas, and then we'll look at the tragedy of Simon Peter. First of all, let's think about the treachery of Judas. Now, when I mention the name Judas, just the name Judas conjures up all sorts of negative feelings and negative emotions in our hearts and minds. For 2,000 years, the name Judas has been associated with treachery and betrayal. I doubt if anyone in here ever knows anyone that had a little baby boy and named him Judas. We just don't name boys Judas because it's associated with treachery any more than we name girls Jezebel. Does anybody in here know anybody that had a little girl and said, I think I'll call her Jezebel? We just don't use those names. I like what one guy said. He said the apostle Paul was persecuted by Nero. He said now 2,000 years later, people name their sons Paul and their dogs Nero. I love that. But we don't use the name Judas because it is associated with treachery. Judas has gone down in history as the one who walked with the Lord for three years. He witnessed the miracles that Jesus did, even raising people from the dead. On at least three different occasions, Jesus raised somebody from the dead, and Judas saw that with his own eyes. Judas heard the words that Jesus spoke. For example... Judas was there when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And in that sermon, there was a strong warning against making a false profession of faith. In that sermon, Jesus said, on the day of judgment, many people will say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name done miracles. And in thy name done many wonderful works. 
Jesus said, but I will say unto them, depart from me, I never knew you. You can put the name Judas beside that verse. Don't ever think that Judas is an example of somebody that had salvation and lost it. That is not the case. Judas never had it to begin with. The Bible says that Jesus knew that he was a devil from the beginning. But Judas saw the miracles. Judas heard the words of Christ. On nine different occasions, he heard Jesus say, I am, as Jesus took upon himself the great eternal name of Almighty God. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, Judas heard that. When Jesus said, I am the water of life, I am the door, I am the way, Judas heard that. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection, I am the light of the world, Judas heard that. Now listen, there's no way, are you listening? There's no way that Judas could have not known that Jesus was who he claimed to be. But Judas made his choice based on his value system. Judas loved money more than he loved God. It's that simple. He loved money more than he loved the truth. And in the end, here's what Judas did. Judas sacrificed the imperishable for that which is perishable. Judas sacrificed that which is eternal for that which is temporary. The Bible says that Jesus crossed over the brook Kidron. The book Kidron, the brook Kidron is a very famous brook in the Holy Land. I've had the privilege of being there myself about 30 years ago. It is the same brook that King David crossed in the Old Testament when he was fleeing from Jerusalem during Absalom's rebellion. Now the word Kidron literally means dark waters. It is located between two mountains. It is located between the mountain that Jerusalem is set upon and the Mount of Olives. Now here's the interesting thing about the brook Kidron. History tells us that there was a man-made channel that was cut from the temple down to the brook Kidron. And it was a channel for the purpose of draining blood from the temple. In the temple, they made lots of animal sacrifices, particularly at the time of the Passover. There was lots of blood to be disposed of. And that blood would flow down that channel into the brook Kidron. Now that means that during this time of the year that we're reading about, when Jesus stepped over the brook Kidron, that means that Jesus looked down and the water ran blood red. I can't help but wonder when Jesus saw that blood red water, if he didn't think about the fact that he represented every lamb that was sacrificed in that temple. I kind of think he did. You see, the Bible says that Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. I like the way Donald Barnhouse, the famous commentary, put it. He said that when Abel brought his lamb in Genesis, there was a lamb for a man. And then later in Exodus, at the time of the Passover, there was one lamb for every family. And then later on the Day of Atonement, when that was established, there was a lamb for the nation. So you had a lamb for a man in Genesis, a lamb for a family in Exodus, a lamb for a nation in Leviticus. But then in the Gospel of John, Jesus showed up to get baptized. And John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And I can't help but wonder when he stepped across that blood red brook, if he didn't think about how he was getting ready to shed his blood for the sins of the world. I kind of think he did. The reason that Jesus stepped over the brook Kidron was to get to a little garden where he often went for refreshment. Now, the book of John doesn't tell us the name of the garden, but the other gospels do. It was the Garden of Gethsemane. Many Bible scholars believe that this little garden was owned by a wealthy friend of the Lord's, and it was made available to him for times of relaxation. It was also a place of prayer. Judas knew about this place. Judas had been there with the Lord Jesus on several occasions. Now, in the text, Judas has already done his dirty deed. The Bible says in the book of Luke that Judas communed with them for 30 pieces of silver. That word communed in the original carries with it the idea of haggling like you would haggle over the price of a horse. Now, can you imagine that? Here is Jesus, the Redeemer. He's getting ready to pay the sin debt for the whole world. He's getting ready to make the ultimate sacrifice. And they are haggling over the price of his betrayal. 
like you would haggle over the price of an animal. Verse 3 tells us that Judas had been given a band of men. That word band is also a very interesting word in the Greek. It means a great multitude. As a matter of fact, the book of Matthew actually uses that phrase, that there was a great multitude that came to arrest the Lord Jesus. Some Bible scholars and historians tell us that there were not just dozens of soldiers that came to arrest the Lord, but there were hundreds. Now, can you imagine that? Hundreds of armed soldiers coming to arrest one Galilean carpenter. Keep in mind, they had heard what he can do. They knew the kind of power that he had. They had heard that this is the man that can literally raise people from the dead. They had heard that this is the man that can literally walk on top of the water. They had heard this is the man that can take five loaves and two fish and feed a great multitude of people. And so they sent hundreds of soldiers, perhaps hundreds, at least several dozen, to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. But little did they know that that was unnecessary. Little did they know what the Lord was getting ready to do. Little did they know that Jesus had orchestrated all of these events so that he would be arrested. There's not going to be any resistance here. As a matter of fact, look at what it says in verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, what are the next two words? Went forth. Do you see that? Don't miss the significance of that. Knowing the significance of what was about to unfold, the Bible says Jesus went forth. Hey, listen to me. He's not running from the cross. He's moving towards the cross. They didn't drag him up Calvary's hill kicking and screaming. He laid down his life willingly. And so here they send all of these soldiers to arrest the Lord Jesus, not realizing that there will be no resistance. Now, I've got to point out something in verse 5 that spoke to my heart. Notice what it says in verse number 5 about Judas. It says, They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, and what are the next three words? Stood with them. All right, let me ask you a question. Who is it that Judas is standing with? Who is it? It says he's, Judas stood with them. Who is it that Judas is standing with? The soldiers. He is standing with the enemies of Christ. I think that's one of the saddest statements in the Bible. I really do. Here's a man that had the privilege of being chosen as one of the original 12. Here's a man that was chosen to be personally taught by the Lord for three years. And yet, when the moment came to decide whose side are you on, we see Judas standing with the enemies of Jesus Christ. I've thought a lot about that. When the real issues are at stake in 2011, when Jesus Christ is on trial in this world today, when people start attacking what Christ stands for today, am I going to always be willing to stand on his side? Are you going to, be all, are you going to always be willing to stand with Christ as opposed to with his enemies? I want to tell you, that's one of the things that I always appreciated about Jerry Falwell. I mean, whether you like or dislike Jerry Falwell, one thing you never had to wonder about, you never had to wonder wh whose side he was on. You may not agree with everything Jerry Falwell ever did or said, but I'll guarantee you one thing, there's one man that was willing to take a stand. And he was willing to take a stand no matter what it cost him in terms of popularity from the world. I remember one day, right after that movie came out on The Passion, Jerry Falwell was being interviewed by the talk show host Michael Savage on the radio. Michael Savage said, well, you know, Dr. Falwell, what that movie The Passion said to me is that we all need to love each other. And Jerry Falwell said, well, I'm glad you got that, but that's not the message of the movie. The message of the movie is that the Son of God came to this world to die on the cross for our sins because we cannot save ourselves. Michael Savage said, you're not saying that only Christians are going to heaven, are you? You're not saying that only people that accept Christ are going to heaven, are you? And Jerry Falwell said, that's exactly what I'm saying. This was on national radio. He said, that's exactly what I'm saying. He said, do you mean to tell me if a Muslim or a Buddhist doesn't accept Christ, they're going to hell? Falwell said, well, I'll take it a step further. If a Baptist doesn't accept Christ, he's going to hell. Listen, it doesn't matter what label you wear. It's what have you done with Jesus Christ? And he was always willing to take a stand. You never had to wonder whose side he was on. 
And you know, I hope that that can be said about me, and I hope that can be said about you, that you never have to wonder whose side we are on. Can I have an amen? Well, the Bible says that they asked the question that Jesus asked them, whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said, I am he. Now, again, I want to point something out to you about I am he. Notice what it says in verse number five. They answered him. Let's, let's pick it up in verse four. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saying to them, I am he. I want you to notice the word he. Now, how many of y'all, like me, you're reading a King James translation tonight? The word he is in italics. That means it was not in the original Greek manuscript. That means that when God gave the word, it was simply I am. The translators added the word he for clarification, and they put it in italics so that you would know that they added it. When they said, when Jesus said, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, what he really said was, listen now, I am. Folks, that's the great name for eternal God. Do you remember when Moses saw a burning bush and that voice came out of the bush? Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Next question Moses asked is, who are you? And do you remember what God said? I am that I am. That speaks of the eternal nature of God. It means I always was, I always am, and I always will be. And Jesus was not afraid to take upon himself that name, I am. As much God as if he had not been a man. As much man as if he had not been God. I remember one night I was watching Trinity Broadcasting Network. They were interviewing a man that belonged to a denomination, and I couldn't believe that they would actually allow this on their network I think since then they've cleaned this type of thing up a little bit and I don't think it's as bad as they used to be. Thanks to men like Hank Hanegraaff and John MacArthur, they've cleaned up their act to a certain degree. But I, I, can, I can remember this man was being interviewed by a man on TBN. He was actually denying the deity of Christ. And he actually made this statement. He said, you know, as I read the New Testament, I don't find anywhere in the New Testament where Jesus actually claimed to be God. He said, you have to read that into it. You know what I thought? I thought, son, you need to reread the New Testament. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Meaning he is the eternal God. Well, here's what's interesting. When Jesus said, I am. Guess what happened to the Roman soldiers? They all fell backwards on their back. They all fell backwards on their back. I mean, just fell flat out on the ground as though they had been hit by a mighty wind. Just bam, on the ground. Now, I think this is worth noting. Have you ever been watching Christian television where a preacher will walk up and he'll hit somebody or he'll blow on them and they'll fall backwards? And then a lot of times the ladies will sit up, straighten their skirt, and then fall back down. Have you ever seen that? I'm not making fun. I'm just, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, I think a lot of those people are sincere. And I think they are, listen, I, I think they are the product of, uh, su- uh, of suggestive, what do you call it? Uh, the power of suggestion. I think most of them know that that is supposed to be the reaction, therefore they do it. By the way, I've never seen such a vivid example of the power of suggestion as I've seen downstairs in the kindergarten class. One day I brought in a bunch of Laffy Taffy. And I said, now boys and girls, do not smell the Laffy Taffy. If you smell the Laffy Taffy, you will break out in uncontrollable laughter. You simply can't help it. And they said, oh, I know you won't. I said, yes, you will. I said, watch. I smelled it and went, ah! (laughs) Boy, their eyes got about this big. I said, you can't help it. I said, Miss Nancy, come here. I had Miss Nancy smell the Laffy Taffy. Oh, she broke out in uncontrollable laughter. I said, Mrs. Barnett, come here. Mrs. Barnett smelled the Laffy Taffy. She smelled the Laffy Taffy. She broke out in uncontrollable laughter. I said, I'm telling you, you can't help it. Now, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I call five kids to the front. I had every one of them smell it. Every one of them fell to the floor laughing. I looked at Nancy and Mrs. Barnett and I said, I've never seen such a clear example of the power of suggestion. Now, I said all that to say this. I think there's a lot of good people who are caught up in the signs and wonders movement. But I think a lot of them are simply doing what what they've been conditioned to do, what they've been taught to do. And I think that it's the power of suggestion. 
Because here's what I find. I don't find anywhere in the Word of God where the disciples of Christ, the friends of Christ, fell backwards under the power of God. The only people in the Bible that I see falling backwards are the enemies of Christ, and I don't want to imitate them. Anyone in the Word of God that ever fell before the Lord fell forward. And it was not an uncontrollable thing. It was not something that was done involuntarily. It was the result of wanting to fall before Him in adoration and in worship. And they would literally many times fall forward and lie prostrate on the ground in worship and in adoration. Now that was for free. I just wanted to throw that in for what it's worth. And that's, you can call that my opinion if you want to, but that's food for thought. Well, we find that Jesus said, I am He. And when Jesus said, I am, boom, they fell backwards. And then here's the most amazing thing to me. He allowed them to get back up. See, that tells me that he died willingly. That tells me right there that he was not a victim. That tells me right there that he, did, he was not murdered. Don't ever think of Jesus as being murdered. Even after hanging on the cross for six long hours, he did not die till he was ready to die. Then he said, it is finished. And the Bible says he did what? He gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. After this, he was arrested. And Judas could not live with his own conscience. God has put within every one of us a moral and a spiritual watchdog. That moral watchdog is called a conscience. And unless you allow your conscience to become seared, and by the way, the word seared in the Bible in reference to the conscience, it is a Greek word and it's where we get the word cauterize. You medical people know what it is to cauterize a blood vessel so that it will no longer bleed. And unless your conscience has been seared or cauterized, it is a guide from God to help you know whether or not you've done right or wrong. I was teaching in Sunday school this morning, and we're talking in Sunday school about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I said this this morning in Sunday school. I said it's a very dangerous thing to say no to God, especially if you're unsaved and God is knocking on your heart's door to be saved. I'll tell you why it's a dangerous thing. Because every time you say no to the Holy Spirit of God, your conscience gets a little bit harder. Your conscience gets a little bit more seared. I was telling the class, if you were to look at these three fingers, you'd find calluses on the end of these three fingers. I could take a needle and stick it in the tip of these fingers, and I would not feel it. Well, you say, preacher, how in the world did you get calluses on your fingers? Well, how do you think? Chopping wood every morning. (laughs) Y'all believe that? No, I didn't think you would. How did I get calluses on the end of my fingers? By playing the guitar. When I was a teenager and I first started playing the guitar, I would literally play the guitar till these fingers bled. Then the next day I couldn't hardly play at all because they were so tender and they were so sore. But I kept playing and I kept playing and I kept playing. And now for all these years I've had calluses on the end of my fingers. And now you can stick a needle in there while I was asleep and and as long as you didn't go too deep. By the way, honey, I'm not recommending this. I would not feel it because they've been calloused over. Listen. Did you know it's possible to grow calluses on your conscience? And I want to tell you, that's a very dangerous thing. I've heard people say, well, you can sin away your day of grace. You can say no to God until he no longer knocks on your heart's door. I personally have a different take on that. I don't think it's so much that God quits knocking as it is that you're no longer able to hear. One day a man was riding in a car with R.G. Lee to a funeral. It was after the funeral and they were riding back from the cemetery And the man said to R.G. Lee, who at that time was pastoring Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, he said, sir, I go to your church, but I'm not a member. And Dr. Lee said, well, why haven't you joined? He said, I've never been saved. He said, well, man, how long have you been coming? He said, about 20 years. He said, why don't you get saved? Here's what the man said. He said, it's a funny thing. When I first started coming to your church, you'd give that invitation at the end and invite people to get saved. Well, I would grab onto the pew in front of me and I would squeeze it till my knuckles turned white and I wouldn't go forward. Sometimes I felt like my heart was going to beat out of my chest, but I never went forward. He said, you know, it's a funny thing now. I can sit through any service you preach. I can sit through any invitation and it never bothers me anymore. He was almost bragging about that. Let me tell you, that's not something to brag about. He got calloused. He grew calluses on his conscience. And when God awakens our conscience to our knowledge of sin, 
That's when we have the choice of either repenting or rejecting. Now, Judas went out and hanged himself. I heard about a man that was accused of murder. He went to trial and he was acquitted. But a few months later, he wrote to his attorney. And he wrote these words. He said, you saved me from the electric chair. But you cannot save me from my conscience. Judas could not be saved from his conscience. The Bible says he went out and hanged himself. You see, Judas was sorrowful, but it was not a sorrow that led to repentance. And there's a difference. Did you know there's a difference between being sorry you did something and being sorry you got caught? And Judas never repented. And as far as we know, Judas is in hell today. Now, let me just say in closing, and we'll look at Peter next week. It's also possible for a believer, I think, to harden their conscience. We allow sin to come into our life and the Holy Spirit convicts us. And we know that it's wrong. And have you ever noticed that when the first time as a believer that you do a certain sin, have you ever noticed how your heart beats a little faster and how you get nervous and and it really bothers you and then afterward you're deeply convicted and you cry out to God for forgiveness? And then if you do that thing again, have you ever noticed it's always easier the second time? It's definitely easier the third time than the fourth time and the fifth time. Every time you do it, it gets easier. What are you doing? You are hardening your heart to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You are growing calluses on your conscience. And I want to tell you, that's a very dangerous thing. Because we all fight sin on one of three battlefields. There's the battlefield of thought. We think about it. Then there's the battlefield of action. We actually do it. And then if we don't respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we move to the battlefield of habit. Now, once we get to the battlefield of habit, I'm not saying that we can't have victory, but it's a lot more difficult. Because most of the time, by the time we've gotten to the battlefield of habit, we've calloused our conscience. There may be somebody here tonight, you've allowed a pet sin to come into your life, and you know in your heart of hearts you've grown way too familiar with it. It doesn't even bother you like it used to. That ought to bother you. It ought to bother you that it doesn't bother you like it used to. Amen? I want to invite you tonight to ask God to peel away those calluses and to help you once again to become sensitive to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Far as we know, Judas is in hell today. If there's somebody here tonight that's never been saved, it's a dangerous thing to say no to God. I told my class this morning that I've been preaching now for 34 years. I have seen hundreds of people saved in personal soul winning and in church services. And I've seen very few saved with gray hairs. Because typically by the time they get to that age, they've allowed themselves to become too calloused to be saved now i'm not saying it can't happen it does happen thank god it does happen but i'm telling you if you're here tonight you've never been saved don't wait